Hello everyone and welcome to this video on ECL disclosures for banks. My name is Callum Allen, I'm a senior manager in the EY Global IFRS team and I'm joined today by my colleagues Law Gagan, the EY IFRS leader for financial services in EMEA, and uh, Fabio Fabiani, the EY IFRS leader for financial services in the UK. Um, our topic for today is um, ECL disclosures for banks. And uh, what we're going to hopefully do is uh, take you through um, some of the lessons that we've learned from, from looking back at the, um, at the 2020 reporting cycle for banks. We'll take you through some of the topical ECL disclosures and then we'll try to shed some light on uh, some of the things that we thought might be challenges or potential improvement points for the 2021 reporting cycle. I should remind you as, as the audience that uh, we're sitting here today as recording this in, in May 2021 and uh, we're obviously looking back at the 2020 uh, reporting cycles. Our content for the day is broken down into four uh, key sections. Uh, the first is the level of detail and comparability of ECL data. Uh, the second is economic scenarios. Thirdly, we'll look at overlays and post-model uh, post adjustments. And then the last topic for the day will be ECL sensitivity analyses. So without further ado, let's then jump straight into the first of those topics. Uh, the level of detail and the comparability of ECL disclosures. Now, Law, when I look back at uh, 2020, um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that it was an unprecedented year uh, in terms of macroeconomic volatility, um, and that meant that the ECL data in banks' financial statements was incredibly uh, valuable uh, information. Now, I know that you've spent a huge amount of effort in recent times uh, benchmarking this data and trying to compare what the various uh, major Euro European banks have, have published. Can you take us through some of the lessons you've learned um, from trying to make these comparisons? Yes, sure. So more than ever, it's true that it's become critical in 2020 to compare banks' expected credit loss estimates and their approach to provisioning. So for, because first we faced, as, we, as you said, an unprecedented global pandemic and economic crisis with extreme volatility of macroeconomic parameters and high uncertainty in the economic outlook. But also the stop and go in the economies led to models working outside the range of data used to build and calibrate them. Also, the effect of support measures was not reflected uh, in the historical data that banks uh, used. So models were unable to project the losses and banks had to supplement them with significant adjustments and overlays. At the same time, as making difficult forecasts of where the economies would go in the next year or and beyond. So there was a lot of judgment involved for all key steps of the estimate and banks had to be a lot more agile in their IFRS 9 processes. In that context, comparing banks' estimates and approaches was a key input and for banks, but also for regulators and auditors, especially since it was the first crisis since, since IFRS 9 was applied for the first time in 2018. And, and what were some of the key measures that you used to compare bank CCLs? Well, there are a lot of relevant indicators to track, and it's fair to say that we are all still on a learning curve to find the right indicators. But some primary indicators are, first, the cost of risk ratio, which is the level of the ECL charge for the period divided by the gross carrying amounts of loans. And this is an indicator that most banks use as it allows comparisons between banks with different size of portfolios. And as you can see on this graph, we have compared the bank's cost of risk in 2020 and 2019. And the graph shows some interesting country trends highlighted by the colors, but also some significant differences amongst banks. So this is a good starting point. Then you need to consider coverage ratios. That is the level of ECL allowance divided by the gross loans. And this is, uh, I would say, the second key indicator. Cost of risk shows the dynamic for the year, but you then need to consider the balance sheet view as the ECL position of banks is also driven by what has been done on transition and in prior periods. And for that, we made, split, uh, we made a further split um, between non-performing loans, so the credit impaired loans under IFRS 9, which have high coverage ratios, and performing loans, that is stage one and two, uh, 
for which the levels are a lot smaller. And finally, a commonly tracked indicator is the proportion of exposures classified in stage two. That is the exposures for which the banks assessed that there was a significant deterioration in credit risk. We tracked a lot more, but these are really the, the most common indicators. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Lou. I, I mean, so whenever I sit down and try to, to make comparisons between banks, um, I, I think one of the key things that, that comes to mind is, is that um, I've always got to remember that banks' businesses are not identical, and they often have very different product mixes. Um, how does that affect uh, your comparisons that you make? Uh, you're right. When doing these analyses, it's really important to make sure that you're not comparing apples and oranges, or rather mortgages and corporate loans. And when you're looking at the entire portfolio of loans to customers as a whole, you need to recognize that banks may have completely different business mix. For instance, uh, these two diagrams on the slide represent two um, how different the balance of the business mix uh, can be between two banks. On the left hand side, one has almost 60% on residential mortgages and 20% on non-financial corporations, while the other has almost a reverse balance. So that's really something you need to, to, to bear in mind. And, and different products attract very different levels of provisioning. This is true under normal circumstances, but this is amplified in the current environment because products also have very different degrees of sensitivity to the economic environment. For instance, well, collater well collateralized loans like, like mortgages attract less provisions by design. Then their sensitivity to the economic environment will vary depending on loans to value local guarantee schemes and other forms of government uh, employment support programs. In contrast, unsecured lending like credit cards is a riskier product which attracts a lot more provisioning and it will also be a lot more sensitive to the economic environment. Therefore, a bank with a significant credit card portfolio shows very different trends compared to banks doing mainly mortgages. And business lending is also a very different driver of the losses, especially in the current circumstances where sectors are unevenly affected by the crisis. You will also see contrasted trends between big corporates and SMEs. Well, those are valuable points, Law, and, and I guess it's also equally applicable to say that um, you know, banks who, who have very different geographical splits um, would also have differences in, in their underlying uh, nature. Um, as some countries experience higher levels of, of credit losses even under normal uh, circumstances for others. Uh, I guess, for example, if, if you're a bank and that has a very significant footprint in South America, um, you might be likely to have uh, structurally higher provisions compared to a bank that's operating in, say, Germany, yeah. uh, where, where losses have been historically low. Absolutely, and this is why country or market is another dimension that needs to be reflected in the comparisons. And Banks with a significant footprint outside their local markets need to split the information for the most significant markets. I think that, that probably gives some, some fairly good background uh, to, to the need for granular and, and comparable data. Um, so then I guess the key question is, is what does that actually mean? Where is the threshold? Um, Lo, what would you consider to be a reasonable level of, of granularity that banks should aim to provide? And uh, have you come across any good examples? Well, there are two angles to that. First, the data and then the granularity by product, by market. So first, if you consider the data, the key area of disclosures are clearly the allocation of exposures and related ECL allowance by stage then the ECL charge for the period, also split by stage, or at least stage one and two on one hand and three on the other. And finally, movements, that is the reconciliation of opening and ending balances by stage for both exposures and related ECL. Then the second dimension is granularity. And as mentioned previously, a key differentiator is the product. As suggested in the examples of ECL disclosures in IFRS 7, a useful split would include mortgages, differentiating the markets if material, credit cards and other forms of unsecured retail lending, again, if material, wholesale, and for that, given size is a critical factor, a distinction between big corporates and smaller businesses like SMEs makes the data more relevant to compare 
sectors is also a key dimension, especially in the current circumstances. And finally, any other specific product, if material, again, like car financing or highly collateralized loans would need to be highlighted because significant others category are generally unhelpful. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. So, I mean, we came across a few examples when we were preparing for this. Um, would you like to take us through some of those now? Sure. So this first example comes from Evian Amro. It's interesting because it combines all the key dimensions I just described. You have a clear product view growth carrying amounts, speed by stage, coverage ratios, and also stage ratios, and the comparative year in one single table. This makes it easy for the reader to catch all the relevant information in one go. The second example comes from UBS, and here what is interesting is the product split, which is quite granular and allows the reader to easily see the most significant exposures and understand their specificities. Real estate financing is shown separately, as well as SMEs, credit cards, and Lombards, which are highly collateralized products attracting very little ECL allowance. The varying levels of coverage ratios show that uh, aggregating these products together would not allow relevant comparisons with peers. Actually, you can find a lot more detail, in particular in the UK, where disclosures have been an area of focus for the regulators and where two industry reports have, have already been published to improve the quality and comparability of disclosures. For instance, you find in some UK banks disclosures um, which shows the stage allocation of gross carrying amounts and related ECL allowance at the level of mortgages split by loan to value bands. So for example, you can see how many loans are in the 50 to 70% uh, loan to value band and then see how much of them are in stage two and what is their coverage ratios. So this allows very granular comparisons between banks. But such information is not available in other European countries. And also we've observed that detailed disclosures may look similar on the surface, but are often heterogeneous in practice and detailed, uh, detailed comparisons uh, remain challenging. Sure. Those are helpful disclosures, Law. And um, I think the other disclosure that I thought was quite important was um, disclosure to do with vulnerable sectors. Now, when I say that, that to me makes sense because vulnerable sectors may represent significant risk concentration uh, for, for banks. And, and if they do, then it's important to disclose information to help uh, users understand both that the, those concentrations exist, as well as uh, the size and inherent riskiness of uh, those those concentrations. So, Lord, did you see any good examples of uh, vulnerable sector disclosures coming through in 2020? Yes, we've seen some interesting examples because, as you say, uh, this has become uh, even more relevant in, in, in the context of this current crisis and it's a, a key factor to understand a bank's exposure. So, a good example uh, of such disclosures is, is uh, shown on the slide. So, it comes from Barclays and it shows the gross carrying amounts of loans and advances at amortized cost for selected sectors split by stage, as well as the related uh, ECL allowance. And it also includes the percentage of total wholesale exposures, which is a, a useful indicator of the concentration. The information is very clear and it should be insightful to see how the data evolved over the next periods. But this is typically an area where quantitative comparisons were challenging in practice due to a lack of consistency in the information disclosed. The, this uh, next slide shows another good example from NatWealth, but it's interesting to note the differences with Barclays as they illustrate well the difficulty uh, we met in building detailed comparisons. So here the exposures include fair value, fair value through OCI, so the scope regarding unbalance sheet items is slightly different. Then off-balance sheet exposures are also shown, but there is a single amount for ECL allowance, so the coverage ratios are not comparable. Finally, banks used different segmentations for sectors and it's often unclear what they, what they have scoped or not, so you're never too sure that uh, you have exactly the same cut in terms of sectors. So finally, this graph shows what we were able to build. Uh, we were simply aiming at showing the amount of exposures by sector and the percentage of the wholesale book they represent. But the data remains heterogeneous as some banks disclose gross carrying amounts when others disclose all exposures, including undrawn amounts. 
and others finally don't specify the exposure is an accounting or a regulatory number. So there is still room for improvement here. So what would you recommend um, to improve the comparability of these disclosures going forward? Well, because these disclosures are not standardized, it's important that banks identify the best minimum common denominator with their peers in their market primarily. Mortgages, credit cards and wholesale should be a good start, as we said, but banks should also highlight their specificities. And for, uh, it's interesting to note that for our European analysis, we actually ended up using a standardized regulatory table published by the banks in the bank's uh, Pillar 3 disclosures called Performing and Non-Performing Exposures and Related Provisions. It shows gross carrying amounts and related ECL allowance by stage with prescribed lines showing separately non-financial corporations of which SMEs and households and this table is shown as an example for BNP Paribas. You can see the gross carrying amounts and related ECL allowance allocated by stage with a further split between performing and non-performing exposures, which is a regulatory concept, and then the lines uh, show non-financial corporations, SMEs and households. And leveraging on standardized reporting based on IFRS information may be a way to improve the consistency across the jurisdiction. And interestingly, with respect to support measures like moratoria and guaranteed loans, European banks often use the regulatory tables required by the European Banking Authority in their financial statements to explain the impact of these, uh, these measures on their ECL estimates. Sure. Thank you, Law. That, that brings us to the end of our first section, and uh, we'll jump into economic scenarios now. So, Fabio, um, economic scenarios of, of you know, with the volatility in the market that we saw in 2020, it is very important to disclose these well. Um, can you tell us some of your thoughts about the disclosures you saw in 2020? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, as we know, the, the calculation of expected credit losses and the IFRS 9 requires a an estimate of the value of uh, the macroeconomic inputs over, over the forecast period. So obviously good disclosures of the economic scenarios and the value of the inputs in those scenarios is critical. I would say that uh, this is especially true in the current context of uh, economic uncertainty, where the estimates about the evolution of key parameters, such as uh, unemployment, uh, GDP, and interest rates over the forecast period are particularly important to users including their expected trend beyond the, that, that forecast period. So they can really understand better what's driving the ECL estimate. Uh, this is also about, uh, because clear disclosures and uh, the assumptions made by banks allow users to compare banks against each other and against any guidance that may be provided in the market, for example, by economists and regulators. Uh, this way they can see, for example, if an entity has been particularly optimistic or pessimistic in, the, in, in its assumptions, which is an important information to interpret the ECL estimate of a particular bank. I would say that most banks have provided a good level of disclosures of the economic scenarios in 2020, with quite some granular details to help users understand the ECL estimate and the judgments that, that they have made in that respect. Okay, so that's interesting. So you're saying they've done quite a good job in, in providing good disclosures on, on the scenarios behind the ECL estimate? Well, I would say that the short answer to this is yes. I mean, I think they've generally done a good job. Uh, however, there's an important caveat to this statement, and that's that uh, one needs to take into account not just the amount of the information disclosed, which is a lot, but also that uh, the basis of the information disclosed. So in a way, while banks have provided a wealth of information, uh, the basis of that information is not, in some cases not always immediately comparable, which can be a challenge at times. Uh, for example, we've seen some banks providing yearly averages of the macroeconomic inputs, take GDP growth, for example. Uh, Others have taken uh, and used the quarterly averages, other five-year averages, for example, or whatever is the number of years of the forecast period and others only the peaks and trough value of uh, those inputs over the forecast period. So you can easily understand how this uh, make the comparison a bit challenging. And um, on top of it, there's also the effect of the weighting of the economic scenarios, which can change the impact of the economic assumption quite substantially. So you really need to combine the two elements, the weightings and the macroeconomic inputs to have the full picture. Uh, take, for example, two banks, they may have 
uh, assume similar scenarios, but the effect of the weighting is as such that the, the impact on ECL of those scenarios is substantially different. And equally, you can take uh, two banks which have quite diverse assumptions in the scenarios, but the weighting applied is as such that uh, ultimately the effect on ECL is almost the same. So that's why a clear disclosure of weighting is as important, I would say, as the disclosure of the key macroeconomic inputs. And that's especially true if there's been a change in the weightings compared to the previous year, which is something we have uh, observed quite often in 2020 due to the effect of COVID-19, which uh, Law referred to as well. Um, so having said that, uh, as I said, uh, we've seen an overall good level of disclosure in this area, good level of granularity and details. Uh, perhaps I can say that the UK banks have done slightly better on average, uh, and this is uh, perhaps because there was uh, uh, some push by the regulator with some regulatory sponsored initiatives in the region, uh, such as the UK Task Force on uh, Disclosure of Expected Credit Losses, uh, the, also called the, the DECO. But we've seen good examples in continental Europe as well. So one thing which is worth calling out as we uh, haven't uh, uh, always seen uh, this close, but can, can be quite important, and is, is also another, another input, which is the assumption around the, the forecast period used to model the scenarios, and in particular, the timing of reversion of the key economic parameters to their long-term long -term average values, which is quite important, especially if it goes beyond the forecasted period. Well, thanks, Fabio. So, so maybe we should look at a few examples. Would you mind taking us through a couple? Yeah, sure. We, we can have a look at a couple of examples which uh, we think are good disclosures uh, in this area. Uh, we can start with the first extract, which uh, comes from NatWest Group. Um, the, this table you can see on the screen provides a good illustration of the value of the key inputs for each of the relevant scenarios, uh, and also how these have changed compared to 2019. It has the probability weight uh, assigned to each scenario. You can see them at the bottom of the table. Um, however, I would say this is only part of the story. Uh, again, it provides a, a good amount of information, but you, get, uh, you only get the average value of each input over the forecast period. Uh, you have it for, for the older island geographies of the group and for each scenario, that's quite important. But if you want to drill down into more details and, and, and see more, you need to understand what's the value of uh, the input for each year of the forecast period. Uh, and that's why it's important after to move to the next level, which is uh, what uh, NatWest provided in the next example, where you can see the value of the input, for example, GDP or unemployment for each year of the forecast period and for each scenario. Well, that's, that's an interesting aspect that you're touching on there, Fabio. You're mentioning providing the data per year um, rather than just providing an average of the entire forecast period. Uh, why is that important? Uh, it's, it's an important question, and I want to stress the point because I've seen many banks providing data about uh, the average value of the inputs used over the forecast period, but not necessarily the, the year on year evolution of the inputs. Uh, the issue I see here is that uh, when the inputs are particularly volatile, which can be the case in, in the current uh, market environment, uh, the average value of the input doesn't necessarily give you the full picture, as you really need to look at the value of the inputs for each period to really understand the bank's economic outlook. Uh, this will be important in 2021, for example. You can see that some entities will expect in their base case a GDP growth pretty soon, followed by a lower, more stable levels going forward. So you can have GDP growth, for example, in 2022, and then it's going to normalize over time. Uh, and then if you look at the downside scenario, for example, you can see that the growth may be delayed to 2023 or beyond, and uh, all these assumptions may be lost if you don't provide a good year-on-year -year disclosure of the value of the inputs over the forecast period. Uh, the other example I wanted to show is, uh, is, is another good disclosure. Uh, as I say, not just in the UK, uh, we have found a good example that's uh, taken from ABN Amber. And this touches on most of the points I mentioned earlier. So you can see the scenario weights, you can see the value of the macroeconomic inputs for each year of the forecast period, and a comparison of those value uh, over uh, the prior period. Uh, the interesting part is that there's also sensitivity analysis, which is shown on the right side of the table, but we'll talk about sensitivities later. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the user generally found it helpful to have a graphical pictorial representation of the value of the key economic inputs over the forecast period. Uh, and that's because it gives really an immediate sense of how the input uh, is going to move over time, which is especially important if the quantitative disclosure was only focusing on the forecast period average of the inputs, as I said earlier. 
you can see on screen a couple of good examples which we have uh, extracted from Societe Generale and from HSBC. Uh, they focus on the GDP growth rate, which is uh, usually a good proxy of the value of, uh, for other economic inputs. So I would say if you need to pick one variable to show a graph for, GDP is generally uh, a good idea. Uh, the, inter the interesting point I want to make, for example, for the HSBC graph on the right, is that uh, not only has the value of the inputs over the forecast period, which is uh, kind of uh, the, the important information I just mentioned, but also you can see the value of the input for the periods before the forecast period, so you have some point of reference. And additionally, it also shows the timing over which the inputs would revert to the long-term mean value, which is where the curve in the graph flattens, which is an important information as well, as I mentioned earlier. Right, Th thank you, Fabio. That was uh, really useful. Now, let's move on to our third topic for the day, which is overlays. Um, now, these gained prominence in 2020 uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and in particular, I mean, we, we saw on some of the big banks overlays that were in the range of one to three billion uh, euros at times, so significant numbers. Um, Law, what do you think some of the reasons for these overlays were and uh, what disclosures did you feel were important to explain uh, the reasons for those overlays? Well, as mentioned earlier, we experienced unprecedented circumstances with stop and go in the economies and unusual government support measures. And this led to three main reasons for overlays. First, model deficiencies led to post-model adjustments. Models were operating outside the boundaries of data used to calibrate them. And several banks referred in their disclosures to models providing unrealistic high default rates. So banks had to book very significant adjustments in order to estimate the losses expected in this crisis. Then the historical correlation between GDPs and other key economic variables and future losses was built without considering the effect of governmental support measures. So adjustments were needed for that and there was significant diversity in practice. At the same time, loans are expect, expected to um, perform better thanks to support measures, but support measures may have a misleading default suppression effect which could lead to a wave of default when they are withdrawn. So banks had to strike a difficult balance between those two effects. Finally, sector induced increases were amplified by the crisis, as we discussed earlier, and adjustments were also applied in order to have an appropriate differentiation in the severity of projected default rates for different industry sectors. And it's important to stress also that some banks have not used overlays, but rather have adapted the macroeconomic parameters to reflect the medium term impacts on the macroeconomic environment and thus minimize an excessive short term volatility. And in that case, uh, it's not uh, called an overlay, but uh, the, the, the objective remains the same. In any case, given the magnitude of the impact, transparency is key. When compared with the size of the total stage one and two ECL allowance, the overlays were as high as 20 to 40 percent. So the users of the financial statements need to understand the amounts at stake and why overlays are needed and how they have been um, estimated. So we've seen uh, increasing transparency, but it remains difficult to compare these effects across banks. Sometimes um, the overall impact on the ECL estimate is not clear and it's quite rare in practice to find uh, a detailed by product or by sector um, and, and the different uh, types of overlays applied. Yeah, and, and that said, I mean, I think we agreed that HSBC had a, had a really nice example. Um, what did you enjoy about their disclosure? Well, HSBC is an interesting example because it's quite detailed. It splits the overlay between retail and wholesale, which is already a first dimension, um, which is important. And then it also identifies five different types of overlays, including, for example, corporate lending and retail probability of default and retail model default suppression, which is a, a key factor. And there are useful um, comments uh, in addition to the table, which explain the different types of overlays that I just described. And what is also interesting to note is the magnitude of the, the, the effects, the numbers. So for instance, you see minus 
1.8 billion on low risk exposures and plus 1.5 billion on retail, so it shows the magnitude of the, uh, the numbers. There are also offsetting, significant offsetting effects. You see minus 0.9 billion on low risk wholesale, but plus 1 billion on corporate lending. So if the overlay was disclosed for wholesale as a whole, it would look as if there was almost no overlay. So it, it shows the importance of a sufficient granularity given the uh, offsetting effects. And then it's also interesting to look at the evolution of a Q121 where both the negative retail PD adjustment and the positive default suppression adjustment have been decreased by 0.8 billion offsetting each other. And these are interesting balancing effects Suggesting, suggesting that the models may be gradually taking over from overlays, although the default suppression remains quite significant. So, so big numbers and, and important to, to explain them quite well. Um, what do you expect to see going forward for 2021? Well, for 2021, transparency over the movements will be critical because it will be a major driver of the cost of risk, so the ECL charge for the, for the period. So it will be uh, very important to understand why uh, the overlays are for and which portfolios they relate to, highlight the possible offsetting effects, and then explain clearly how the overlays were determined and, and whether they are expected, when they are expected to be reversed and according to which logic or mechanism. Also, it will be part of the lessons learned to assess whether these overlays suggest that some model improvements are needed or whether it's an unavoidable feature of the IFRS 9 uh, approach uh, under such unforeseen uh, circumstances. Okay, thank you, Law. Um, let's move on to our final topic then for, for today, and that is uh, sensitivities, uh, sensitivity analysis for ECLs. Um, Fabio, uh, this one's yours, um, but I think I would say that with ECL being such a significant and judgmental number, um, the final number that banks chose to put in their financial statements is one thing, and that's very important data. But it's also very important to understand the, the potential range in which ECL may, may ultimately play out, because after all, it is just an estimate. And um, so sensitivity is, to me, very important information. Um, what were your thoughts and, and what did you observe in terms of sensitivity disclosures in 2020? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, each ECL estimate with all the complexity that the I think we have touched on a few times during this uh, this video. It's uh, it's definitely an area of estimation uncertainty. So good disclosure of sensitivity is, uh, is quite important to use over the financial statement. Uh, if I look at the disclosure of sensitivity in 2020, I've seen quite a lot of information provided by banks, and uh, that that's both on single factor and multi factor sensitivity analysis, as well as good narrative disclosure to really explain the approach and assumption behind the sensitivity. So overall, I would say that uh, many banks have provided good quality information on this area, and this is an area of interest to user of the financial statements, as I said, because the, that's really given to the amount of judgment involved. Um, so knowing how much an estimate will change, if reasonable, reasonably possible alternative assumption would be used, it's, it's quite useful. You mentioned two interesting terms over there. You said multi-factor and single-factor analysis. What do you mean by those terms? Yeah, there's essentially two ways of providing sensitivity analysis. Uh, one is to create a different economic scenario or to change the weighting of uh, the existing scenario, which of course will affect the impact of many economic variables at the same time. So all the key inputs that you have used in that scenario, take GDP, interest rate, and employment. Uh, this is a, an example of a multi-factor sensitivity analysis. And uh, typically the way I've seen it done is by waiting to 100% some of the scenarios that have been used for the ECL estimates. And typically I've seen the central scenarios and then you can take one upside or one downside. Ideally, you really should choose the one that better depicts the effect of a non-linearity. Uh, another approach is to pick selected inputs and to show the effect of moving the dial up and down on those inputs only. And this could be done, for example, by changing the value of the GDP growth rate or the unemployment rate in isolation. Or you could take, for example, the house pricing index, uh, which can be a relevant indicator, for example, for a mortgage portfolio. Um, I've also seen an interesting SICR sensitivity, so a sensitivity on the significant increase in credit risk. Uh, 
which is done by showing the effects on ECL of applying lifetime ECLs instead of 12 months ECLs. Uh, this is also an area where we have <clears throat> observed uh, to a common theme that I think we've uh, referred to a few times during this uh, video. Uh, we've seen some inconsistency in the basis of preparation and presentation of the relevant disclosures, which uh, uh, did not always allow full comparability. Uh, just a couple of examples. Um, the effect of overlays is one area where, where we've seen some diversity. And this is important because uh, many overlays are, are made outside of the model, uh, but sensitivities sometimes are calculated on the model output only. So in this, in, in this case, if you do not include sensitivities, the analysis would the, the overlay, the, the sensitivity would not show the complete effect of uh, on ECL of a change in the probability weighting, so the 100% weighting, which I referred to. And then the stage three assets and off balance sheet exposures, they, there's also some inconsistency there because sometimes they're included, sometimes they're excluded, sometimes it's not always clear whether they are there. So that's also an area where, where we see some challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, were there any good examples that you would uh, call out? Yeah, certainly uh, quite a lot of good examples, I would say, uh, that they've seen in 2020, and uh, we've selected a few extracts on this video. Uh, there's many others, but those that uh, we thought were helpful to, to make some points on, uh, on, on, on what I just mentioned. So the first one I wanted to show is a disclosure from ING. You can see it on screen. And if you remember the one I've shown on uh, from AB and Ambro, the macroeconomic scenarios, you can see some similarities. So, uh, you can see the information is embedded in, into one single table, which has the macroeconomic inputs. So effectively, at uh, snapshots you have both the value of the inputs uh, over the forecast period in the for each scenario but also you have on the right side of the table the effect uh, on ecl of weighting 100 percent each of these scenarios so it's quite easy to digest it's only one page uh, so it's it's a good example i would say if there's a there's a limit to this is that uh, you may lose a little bit of detail which may be helpful such as the impact uh, by portfolio or by stage which can be important, but of course, complicate the picture. So if you want to see an example of that, you could see the next example, which is a structure from Barclays. And you can see that the, the, the table starts to be a, a way more detailed and granular, because if you look at these, and by the way, that's only a piece of it, I only extracted the one that could fit the screen, uh, but you can see what it shows. It shows the effect of weighting by 100% each economic scenarios. And then you can see there's an impact if you look at the headers on the left side, uh, separately by cross carrying amounts, by the ECL, and then you can see the coverage ratio. Uh, you can also see split by portfolio. So in this case, Barclays has uh, chosen a split for the three key portfolio of the bank. So you have home loans, credit cards, slash unsecured lending, and wholesale loans. And then you can also see, which is quite important, I know it's quite uh, dear to the analyst's heart, uh, the split uh, of the fact by stage. So um, that's, that's separately shown, and, 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 and as I mentioned, I had to cut the disclosure a little bit to make it fit the screen, but it will also show the effect on, uh, on the stage three population. Um, the next example I want to show, just to show an uh, uh, example of single factor sensitivity, is taken from Lloyd's Banking Group. This is a good illustration of, uh, as I say, the single factor analysis, and you can see that uh, shows the effect on the top side of the table of a shift in the house prices index, which will affect value of collateral, so particularly relevant for a mortgage portfolio. And in the bottom half, you can see the impact on ECL of shifting the unemployment rate by relevant portfolio. So you can see separately for mortgages, retail, commercial, and other lending exposures. Uh, the last example I wanted to, she to, to show is a, is, a, is a good disclosure from UBS this time. Again, providing a single factor sensitivity for some of the key inputs. Uh, and interesting, this shows the effect of a shift uh, for each of the different scenarios. For example, you can see how a 1% increase in unemployment rate has a different effect on the ECL in the baseline scenario, the downside scenario, and in the way that average ECL. Those are really useful uh, scenarios to take us through there, Fabio. Um, what about 2021? How do you expect this to develop going forward? Um, yeah, going forward, I would say uh, I would expect to see banks uh, continue to make efforts to provide good quality sensitivity disclosures, as this is definitely a useful area for, of information for a uh, user of the financial statesman. However, as scenarios evolve uh, with different expectations on how the economy is going to recover from the current situation of uncertainty, I think it's likely we're going to see still some challenges on comparability. So any efforts made in that respect to achieve a, a better consistency will be important. 
for example, disclose an impact on the sensitivity on staging uh, or across different products uh, on a consistent manner, for example, showing as a minimum of wholesale versus retail effects of the sensitivity when it's relevant and material to, to a bank. And then uh, I'd like to see uh, a slightly more comprehensive narrative around how the sensitivity analysis is developed and the assumption behind it. And uh, to the point I made earlier, it would be good to have a good explanation of the effect of the post-model adjustment and overlays on the sensitivity. All right, thank you, Fabio. That was uh, very interesting. And uh, that concludes the formal content for this video today. Uh, I'd like to thank both Law and Fabio for your insights uh, and your time today. And before uh, we wrap up the video, if you would like to access additional information, may I draw your attention to, to one of three publications. Firstly, you may want to look at Good Bank 2020. Now, Good Bank is, of course, EY's illustrative financial statements for banks. And in the 2020 edition, you'll find a number of illustrative disclosures that cover some of the points we spoke about today. Secondly, there is EY's applying IFRS titled Disclosure of COVID-19 Impact on Expected Credit Losses of Banks. Again, this publication is, is specifically tailored to address most of the, the items that we've spoken about today. In fact, it goes into additional detail and includes additional examples and additional considerations. Finally, and uh, we thought that this one was so important that we actually refilmed the last minutes of this video so that we could draw your attention to it. May I draw your attention to EY Insights on 2020 Expected Credit Losses. You would have heard during the course of, our, of the video that Law and I mentioned a benchmarking exercise that took place in 2021. Now, this publication summarizes the results of that benchmark. In particular, the benchmark I looked at the published ECL data of 18 large banking institutions that were headquartered in Europe. And you may find the results and, uh, and, and the information contained in the publication to be informative and uh, certainly thought-provoking as you look forward towards the 2021 reporting cycle. All three of these publications are, are accessible via www.ey.com forward slash IFRS. Thank you for watching this video and have a fantastic day further.